Perfect. Yeah, we're good. Um, good. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, I wanted to, I'm Bree Coggins. I'm our um, Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Allied Health Sciences. So you probably get a lot of emails from me and um, and hear from me a lot with uh, newsletters from the college. So we're so glad that you are connecting with us tonight, just in this crazy time we're all going through together. Um, so a few important notes are on the screen and we're gonna keep you all muted just to eliminate feedback noise. The, like I said before the chat feature, will be our main way of communicating uh, tonight. Just if you have a question or any kind of comments with anybody, use the chat function, make sure it's to everyone so we don't miss your question. Uh, if you have technical difficulties at all and need help with that, you can directly message Soleil. She's helping with some IT support for us and is doing the slides on the back end. So we appreciate her help tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, acknowledge a few distinguished guests that we have, some we have past distinguished alumni, for the college leadership council members for um, that support the college and then just our community partners we have faculty and staff and um, some foundation colleagues so really appreciate all of your support of the of the colleges we're going through all of this um, our agenda tonight includes an update from dean Whalen, and then we'll hear from three alumni who are battling COVID 19 on the front lines we have two uh, well one is pat tilly she's our medical lab science faculty member here um, Stephanie Gerth is a, an MLS alumna, and then Wesley Bender is a respiratory therapy alumna who um, are all working out in the field. So we'll look forward to hearing from them after Tina. And then that'll be followed by a Q&A session. I have collected a few questions ahead of time that we got through the registration form. So I'm planning to ask those first. And then if you have any questions during the session, you can put that in the chat box. So. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note is uh, we just are trying to figure out what alumni engagement looks like right now. I think this is a really interesting way to connect with you all and maybe something we should have been doing already. Um, but I'd love to hear from you at any point after this if you have thoughts or have um, other experiences of ways you've enjoyed connecting with others. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email after this so you'll have my contact information as well. Um, but I would just love to hear from you and hear your thoughts. So um, I will now turn things over to Dean and Tina Whalen. And Tina, you're there. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. I can't see all of you. I see your initials, and I see that you're on in the um, participant list. But thank you all for joining us tonight. This is a very extraordinary time. I think we've uh, used that as a descriptor of what we've been going through since the middle of March. I'm sure many people have been saying that. It's unusual, it's extraordinary, it's unprecedented, yet we're managing, right? We're doing it and we're getting it done. So um, I'm happy that you all are here with us tonight. I wish we could see each other in real time and, and we are seeing each other in real time, but in real three-dimensional time, but um, it's good to, to get together and I'm happy that I'm able to give you an update on what's going on in the college. We've been very busy. Um, I think if possible, busier than we normally are uh, because there's just been so much ongoing change. Uh, at the very beginning, we would make a decision, set a policy at 10 in the morning, send it out at 11 and by 12 o'clock, I was resending it and changing it and giving the newer update as we came um, to get it. So things were changing, as you all know, on an hour by hour basis, sometimes even less than that. Things have settled down a little bit um, in terms of that sort of time frame, but we are still constantly in a fluid situation and um, just really forecasting as best we can what the future looks like. So I'm really glad that you're here. Um, and I have a lot of positives to share with you. I'm, I'm really a positive person. I like to look at the class half full and I'm looking at it that way in this situation as well. And I am so proud of the work our college has been able to do. And I just wanna share some of that with you now and then um, turn it over to the real heroes who are the people that are our alumni in the trenches um, who are working in the field to uh, do the diagnostics and fight this disease uh, so that we can all come back to some sense of 
a new normal. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And Pat Tilly will tell you probably not a lot about herself, but she's like a world expert. I mean, the World Health Association consults her. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Pat's going to have to to talk to us about as well. So, and then we'll take your questions. So let's just start with my slides and I'll, I'll give you the update. Can you advance my slides, Clay? Thanks. Okay, so in summer, in spring semester on um, the 13th of March, which happened to be a Friday, so it was a Friday the 13th, so there you go, uh, we got the mandate that we were going to be uh, closing campus and going remote for the rest of the spring semester. That happened to be um, the last day of classes before the spring break. And so uh, the university extended spring break by three days to give everyone 10 days to convert all of the face-to-face -face classes that we had across the campus to an online or remote learning situation. Now, as as you guys know, in, in CAS, we have a number of online programs. So the good news for us was that we weren't 100% face-to-face to start with. So we had to convert maybe about 40% of our classes because about 50 to 60% in any given semester is online. And some of our programs, as you know, are 100% online. So over the course of those 10 days, 74% uh, of our spring uh, courses, or 312, got converted to a remote learning environment. And I want to do a shout out to CETUS, that's our Center for Educational Technology and Instructional Support, because they were essential in helping our faculty get this done. Our faculty took this very seriously from the get-go, put a lot of extra time and effort into the process, and with CETUS's help, both for our core faculty and any adjuncts that we had, um, they were able to get this done in a 10-day time frame. We have WebEx function, just like we're doing tonight, so we did a lot of WebEx things that were simultaneously. We did asynchronous things. The good news we, is that we had a lot of um, software programs that could support, and CETUS was very helpful in educating our faculty who didn't know how to use those programs about how to best communicate with their students. Uh, we worried about our students' connectivity and did a, a lot of analysis of students to make sure they had laptops. If they didn't have laptops, we had a loaner system for them. Uh, there was a remote exam proctoring service that was put into place called Honor Lock. That was done by the university. Students needed a camera on their laptop to use that program. So if we found out we had students who didn't have cameras on their laptops, made arrangements for them to either come into the college to take their exams with a borrowed laptop or um, got a laptop to them. Um, our associate dean, Charity Accurso, managed all that information as well as honor lock. And we made sure that our students had what they needed to finish that spring semester successfully. I had to make the difficult decision to suspend all of our clinical and field experiences, which we did effective March 21st. Uh, we had numerous, numerous WebEx calls, Teams meetings, conference calls, where I'd have 31 program directors and clin ed people on telling me what each individual program was doing, where they were in their process, if their students were at the uh, hour number they needed to get to or how close they were. And then we pulled the plug on March 21st for everyone um, and just stopped clinical for that time period. Um, and then um, our on-campus research was also halted for everything that was not essential and basically everything that was not a COVID-related research project was deemed non-essential. So we um, had to just put the brakes on that as well. So that's what happened in spring semester. But the good news is, I think if we go to the next slide, hopefully, delay, thank you. Um, well, that's not what I wanted to say, but we graduated um, 618 students in the spring semester. We had very few uh, delays in graduation. 
we were uh, we had a couple of students that needed more clinical hours, and we I'll give you the good news early about that. We've got them back in clinic, finishing up those hours. Um, if they were graduate students, our graduate school made adjustments uh, so that they could take incompletes, and they will earn a spring uh, semester diploma, and they'll be eligible for board examination later this summer. So they're really not losing time to when they can get their license and go out into the workforce. Uh, a lot of our distance learning people went on without a beat. As we mentioned, many of them were and are uh, first line providers, particularly in MLS and RT, and um, they are, are real heroes in all of this in terms of covering the need in the clinics and in the hospitals, but also continuing on with their studies. Our faculty worked with them to give them extensions on assignments, submissions, exams, whatever they needed. And at the end of the day, we graduated 618 students in the spring semester with very few people that had to take a deferral and extend into the next semester or beyond. We, our faculty did amazing virtual graduation ceremonies. Uh, People put together these wonderful videos, uh, and we did a lot of recording for all of those and tried to send our students off in a positive uh, way. Um, we also bought them a little uh, charger and um, sent them personal notes, and it's been really rewarding to get personal thank you notes back from students letting us know how, how much that meant to them and how much they appreciated our gesture, and it was, it was a sad, but yet a very uh, gratifying thing to be able to, to do something around graduation. We will have a face-to-face -face something or other reception at the university level when we're able to all be able to be back together again um, in, the real, in the real space. But um, in the meantime, we, we definitely made some acknowledgement to the landmark achievement these students were able to to pull off with this COVID interruption. So now, Soleil, maybe you would go to summer. I don't know if my slides were out of order. Thank you. So summer semester. So we heard um, probably in early or to mid-April that we were likely going to be remote for summer. So again, we pulled everybody together. The program directors have been awesome. Uh, they've worked with faculty. They've done all kinds of things. So the first thing we said was, uh, what do you need to teach summer remotely? We bought a lot of software for people uh, so that individuals could start on time and actually do the coursework as they were intended to. So for our physical therapy and occupational therapy students, they start in the summer. We just started that, that, those cohorts a week ago. Um, they're doing virtual anatomy dissection. That's not typically how they do anatomy dissection. They typically do it with cadavers in the gross anatomy lab. But we bought a dissector program, and our emeritus faculty, Lizanne Mulligan, agreed to teach in that, in that modality so that we are offering that course that they need, which is really a, a, a foundational course for their curriculum. And we started them on time, and we started them all remote. So for those graduate students that live in Cleveland or Kansas City or Columbus, they didn't have to come to UC and rent an apartment. They can be completely remote, that first cohort, online for this entire summer semester. In other cases, faculty pulled what we call our didactic information, which would be our classroom and our lab stuff. We pulled it all forward into the spring semester to offer it in a virtual format with the idea that they may be able to go back to clinic later this summer. And the good news about clinic is we've worked really hard on that, and we've got 39 students that started clinical on Monday. So we're, we'll be phasing back into clinical actually sooner than we were planning for. So for me, that's just icing, and it's helping our students stay on track and move through their programs without any delay. Uh, so. We'll move on, and you can see our enrollment for this summer is actually uh, the highest we've had. Uh, we exceeded our enrollment projection by 66 students 
from summer of 2019, which is pretty amazing considering that we are in this COVID pandemic. So very proud of that and all that our faculty did to make that happen. Okay, Soleil, please. Um, and so I already told you, on May 18th, we got 39 of our students back to clinic. A few of them are um, making up the time they didn't have finished before we had to pull the plug in March. A lot of them are in their next rotation, so the rising next year students are keeping on track. Um, we have students out in medical labs, in AMIT, in physical therapy, um, social work, uh, started in that first go round. not all of the students. Um, we had to go through a whole process to be able to get our students trained on uh, the specifics of COVID and PPE and what they really need to have and what they really need to do. And then we, our partners at UC Health have been awesome, uh, worked very hard with them to get the PPE for the students who weren't going to have it provided by their site, which was a big barrier for a lot of our sites to be able to take our students back. We're sending each of our students who need it uh, with what we call a PPE kit, which is a face shield as well as masks, face masks. Um, and then, of course, they know the CDC rules and the distancing if possible, but a lot of our students need to be up close and personal with the clients that they're serving. For the people like medical lab, um, they're not in direct patient care. Uh, many of them didn't need the same PPE and many of their sites were providing that. But the good news is we got through all of that. We got all the approvals that we needed all the way up to the level of our provost and our students went back to clinic on the 18th of May. We have now a wave of students between now and the end of summer and we're gonna do staged return uh, starting June 1 all the way through um, the rest of the summer semester and of course into the fall. But we've got our process figured out. We're following our own process and um, it's going very well so far. So, and our directors of Clin Ed were amazing and, and awesome. And I think, you know, we couldn't have done it if we hadn't all worked together just hand in glove to make this work for our students. So we're very proud of that. It's a huge accomplishment. Friday was a good day, six o'clock when I got the email that we had the go ahead to start. So that was great. Next, Soleil, please. And then research. So we had to stop our research activities that were non-essential. Um, and we are in the process now as a university of resuming those activities. Everything comes with a big grid of how we're going to do it, how we're going to social distance, how we're going to keep things clean, how many people can we have in the lab at any given time. And all of that is being gathered right now with the, with the plan of starting to repopulate our research labs beginning June 1. Obviously, not everybody's going back on June 1. Uh, some people have the type of research that it's not really possible. Uh, they won't have participants because they can't, but we are in the process of resuming uh, those activities and in the planning stages for all of that right now. Our research as a, as a college is up again this year. We've had 137% increase in research expenditures, meaning grant support from external agencies over the last four years. We're up again this year. Uh, we exceeded our goal by 120,000 this year, and we have 14 proposals that are scheduled to go in between now and the end of the year. So our faculty researchers are continuing to do their work. Um, even with this delay, they may not be in their labs, but they're working remotely. They're, they're synthesizing data. They're writing manuscripts. They're, they're staying very, very active. So, uh, we have not let this COVID thing shut us down. We're working differently. I think we're working more. Um, everybody's on all the time, uh, which is both good and bad because we're not taking any breaks and that's not good. But at the same time, um, the college is really keeping our students at the center and um, moving people to graduation and through their programs and keeping our research mission alive. And, and that's really, you know, what we're here to do. So very proud of 
what we've been able to do in a relatively short while um, with this very extraordinary circumstance that we're faced with. So I think that's my slide, I believe. Oh, fall semester, I gotta finish fall. Uh, so we're in the, in the process of um, planning a fall semester and it's not just us, the whole university is. And we look to be up again for fall. So we're really hoping that those numbers will hold. Uh, we are doing some real interesting things around uh, putting together, we're planning for remote, uh, not 100%, but we're planning to be at least 70, 75% remote. We certainly have classes that we need to offer face-to-face, -face, but then we have to figure out social distancing and, you know, we might have to do a lab three times over so we have less students in the lab and they can be spread apart. I'm making sure that we'll have the PPE for our students that they do have to be closer together working on each other to learn certain techniques. Uh, we have our faculty, again, have been what we called faculty together on this, I think, at the end of April and said now start thinking about fall. So people have reordered their classes to do things that would lend itself better to an online earlier and then pushed other things back later. As I said, we've got all those software programs, those simulation cases. Many of these things, I think, will be integrated as best practice for the future, not so that we can be 100% remote or online, but to just enhance our students' learning, doing something maybe a little more blended and hybrid. Uh, we're certainly collecting a lot of data on outcomes as we do these things, but um, we're really planning for a remote where we wouldn't have a very high density of population on the campus so that we could keep the, the CDC guidelines in the forefront, ensure everybody's safety and health, um, and then get our students the training they needed in the courses where they absolutely must be on campus to, to learn that material. Um, as you all know, we have a lot of psychomotor kinds of things our students have to learn how to do with their hands. That's really hard to simulate completely online. So we're, we're being judicious about which ones of those need to come back to campus and how we would best social distance and, and manage to, to pull those off. Uh, Charity Accurso, our associate dean, I had them measuring uh, square footage so we could look at our classrooms and say, okay, this classroom could accommodate up to 40 students. We could use this for that. We could turn this into a lab. So we're just trying to be really innovative and um, think through how we can do this and pull it off, maintaining all those uh, precautions and keeping everybody's safety and health at the forefront. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, orientation starts all virtual for our first year undergrad students on June 8th. I did a town hall with them last night. Um, a number of our students who are starting in the, in the fall and um, there's three population committees all over campus working on all these issues that, that we're working on in the college. So that, I think that really is my last slide. So there you go. All right, perfect. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you, Tina, so much. Um, so a reminder, if you have questions for, for Tina or any of our speakers as we move forward, just use the chat box. Um, so next we have Pat Tilly, who's associate professor in the MLS program here at the college. Well, good evening and thanks everybody for joining us too. I give you a brief look at the global area before I talk about some of our students, but I am the chair of the microbiology committee that works with an organization called the International Federation of Biomedical Lab Science. And we work with all the laboratory professional organizations across the globe. And we work as an advisory group to the World Health Organization. So my group's been pretty busy and I have members all the way from Croatia and Africa and Italy as well, some of the very hard hit areas. And we had a lot of conversations, especially between March and April, when all the information was coming out about the diagnostic testing and, and what it was doing and what it was not doing and what are the best practices. So one of the things I think if you, you know, if you watch all the news and the social media, I think you see a lot of information about nursing and the physicians and what people normally associate as a frontline workers. 
And you'll notice my first line here is the front line is the med lab science people were really front line and you don't really see a lot about them because they don't have the direct patient contact like Tina said. But those are the individuals that were out there getting the brand new testing formats and, and trying to bring up these diagnostics as rapidly as they could to meet the need. And when you start seeing things about, you know, the tests aren't as good as they're supposed to be and they're not working and we really don't have the information, what you have to remember is across all of these different countries, there's different regulations, but there's also like in the United States, the FDA, when they put assays out under a situation like this, the auspices is that the assay being put out faster than we normally would. In other words, doesn't meet the regulations and the rigor that we would normally put a diagnostic test through, but the risks of that are far less than not having something out there. So the so the basically the public is more important than getting that test out there. And over time, we'll make corrections to those things. So when Tina says that she would make it a decision in the morning and change it by noon, within about six weeks, there were more than 7,000 peer-reviewed articles on COVID-19. And so when you look at the World Health Organization and the CDC and everybody trying to pull information together, that's why you're seeing what you would perceive as, well, they didn't know what they were talking about or the information is changing because it is changing so fast. So the lab science people, in, in my opinion, are really frontline because they're the ones that help bring this testing up. And they went through some of the same kind of things they've had to do, putting individual shifts so that they didn't cross contaminate because we didn't know a lot about this. And the reason social distancing has been working really is because of the way the virus is transmitting. Um, you know, managing normal, I don't know that in a lab, lab can be feast or famine. So they they managed normal as best they can. They did all the validations. And the one thing I think that's also important to know is the data that's coming out of the labs, and it's not just the COVID-19 micro kind of data or the virus data, it's the data that's associated with all the other departments because you know, what's really unusual about this coronavirus is the disease it causes. It is more contagious than the other ones that we've seen in the past. But when you go back historically and look at it, it's transmitted the same way. Um, we know people develop antibodies. Again, the lab people are the ones that are going to bring that data forward to help us continue to manage this. And I think that's important. And before I turn it over to our alum, the one other thing I'd like to say is Tina mentioned our students. Uh, I teach remotely online for the uh, students that are actually out there working in the labs. And my, one of my classes started in March, right about when this all hit. And those students actually went through that class and you wouldn't have known they were in a pandemic. Um, they would, you know, let me know if there was anything real crazy going on. And right now I have 240 students in online and same same thing. And what I find really interesting is I think they're almost more open and they talk. Sometimes you get emails from them because they have someone to talk to because they are so socially distanced from everybody, but they're really troopers and they're really doing a good job. And so we hear a lot of really good things from them and they really are very thankful. And I think this is kind of a little bit when I say managing normal for our students, keeping up with working on their degrees as part of their normal. So, um, you know, when you think about lab people, you aren't gonna see them in the news, but, but they're out there doing a lot of really good work. And then a lot of UC students are from every end of the country that you can imagine. That's all I have. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear your perspective and, and then really from the faculty side too, um, just to, to hear about our students. Um, so next we have Stephanie, uh, who is an MLS professional. She works for UC Health um, at our Clifton campus. Stephanie.
Stephanie, are you talking? You're still on mute if you're trying to talk. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good now. All right. So I work in the diagnostic lab at University of Cincinnati Hospital. And early in the pandemic, administration recognized, I think, the, the severity and the magnitude that this potentially could be. So it, it was very quick that they uh, made the decision to essentially eliminate any non-critical procedures and services. And in doing so, um, they were able to conserve the PPE so our frontline people would have it. To, and also comes they were also able to conserve other resources so that if we would have a surge of COVID patients, we would be ready for it. Um, that hasn't happened like it has in other cities, like New York, for example, as everyone is aware. And so what that means to the lab currently is that, um, and we're picking back up, but our numbers in the lab of, um, of tests just plummeted. We had honestly very little to do for quite a while and people took our cuts. And I can say that, um, Something like that, it seems to me, could cause a lot of um, morale issues, but in our lab, it didn't. I think everybody understood what was going on. Everybody wanted to work together. People were donating PTO to each other that really needed to be able to cover the costs. So that was a very positive thing. And also, um, in this extra time that we've had, um, we've been able to kind of repurpose ourselves to be able to support the, the COVID effort. So people have been willing to pitch in however they can. I mean, we've had techs who have uh, created assembly lines to um, put together the testing kits to get out to the front line so they would have it. Um, when there was a shortage, we were figuring out how to um, manage what we had and stretch it as far as we could and get it out. Um, we had, um, when they were working on setting up the um, it, um, the potential unit for um, overflow down at the convention center, we had techs and uh, technical associates who were volunteering and trained to help with point of care testing if um, if they would need be with they would be needed to do that. These are people who don't normally have patient contact who were volunteering to do that if if they needed to. Um, I have experience in molecular and the testing that's being done currently is being done through our molecular department in microbiology and also in our precision medicine lab. So um, as is now, we um, have the capability to do about 1,300 tests a day. And within the next few weeks, we should have that about tripled. Um, we're only getting about 400 tests a day, but when it starts to roll in, when government starts to, I guess, get organized and figure out how we're going to be testing, um, we'll be ready for it. Um, testing platforms that we're using, three of them we already had. We were using them for other things. So we needed to just validate this test in our precision medicine lab. Um, we're kind of starting from scratch. People have been working extremely hard to get these uh, procedures verified and validated. So we're ready to go. That's all I've got. <laughs> No, that's really great. I love hearing about just the sense of collaboration and all hands on deck and, um, you know, getting through it together and, you know, not business as usual, obviously, and um, just being prepared for, you know, plan B and C and whatever it is. Um, no, but I appreciate your perspective and um, especially here in Cincinnati too, just with our, our big partners at UC Health, we appreciate all of you and, and what you're doing. Thank you. So um, finally, for our speakers, we have um, Wesley Bender, who is a clinical instructor at Shawnee State. Um, and then after that, we'll do Q&A. Okay, All right. Um, so I get a lot about what is a respiratory therapist. Um, heroes. Uh, that's coming out now in news. So I always explain that we are cardiopulmonary experts trained in critical care medicine. Um, I constantly get the question of, oh, don't you just get tired of giving breathing treatments all day? Um, but we do way more than that. Um, we constantly are working with physicians um, at making suggestions um, with different therapeutic regimens from managing ventilators to BiPAP, CPAPs, um, to performing different other modalities that we can do. Um, so during this pandemic, we've been very busy, um, not so much here in Ohio. I think a lot of the social distancing had a lot to do with cutting down on the amount of patients and exposure that we saw. 
Um, but I, as well as I'm a clinical instructor for Shawnee State University, and I um, also currently work full time as a registered respiratory therapist at Southern Ohio Medical Center in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, so we made some very big changes uh, as a hospital. Um, one of the big things that we did, we changed in our ER, um, instead of physicians just placing orders for breathing treatments or BiPAPs, CPAPs, blood gases, um, they put in what was called an RT, cess and treat. So in that uh, sense, we were consulted by the ER and we would go and assess these patients and speak to the physician and suggest different modalities that we can do. Um, we did this specifically too with help eliminating the exposure of aerosols with these uh, potential and uh, positive coronavirus patients. Um, we, I know my manager initially, she went on a, a spending spree of buying every filtration device that we could get. Um, so that way we could produce or reduce the article, particle production um, from nebulizers and from our BiPAPs and ventilators. Um, we also saw an issue as well with uh, room availability in our ER setting. Um, as most of you know that during this pandemic, most patients that are under um, investigation for coronavirus or have tested positive um, are required to be placed in what's called a negative pressure room. Um, so these rooms are kind of limited, especially in most hospitals and um, so that was one of the issues we ran into. Um, another thing that we had to change our mindset of thinking is emergent situations. Um, I had a therapist that I work with. She said, there's no such thing as an emergent situation in a pandemic. Um, so, you know, normal situation when there was an issue where somebody had lost pulse and they would call, you know, code blue, over, code blue overhead. Um, as a respiratory therapist, it's our job to respond to all of those within the hospital. Um, normally, prior to this, we would just stop what we were doing and instantly go to the patient's room and start. Um, now we're having to stop and think, you know, what PPE do I need? What other pieces of equipment do I need to help protect the others that are caring for this patient in this room? So, you know, in some emergent situations, it's kind of slowed down that process. Um, so with my local hospital that I work at here in Portsmouth, Ohio, um, we've had a low COVID-19 population um, and we've not really seen a whole lot of hospitalization with patients that are testing. Positive. Um, in the beginning, we, being a smaller facility, had the lack of availability for testing. Um, most of our testing would take uh, multiple days to be sent off to determine if these patients were um, COVID-19 positive. So that was also a little bit touch base in the beginning as far as room availability. Um, so as a perspective of an RT with COVID-19 patients, some of the things that we are seeing um, throughout all locations from New York to overseas um, are the desaturation um, in oxygenation. So we're seeing the decrease in the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. And we're seeing this a lot in patients that are not symptomatic of it. Most patients, when we see a decrease in blood, um, we usually start seeing signs of what's called peripheral or central cyanosis, which is the blue collar that you would see of the nails or the lips. Um, and we're not seeing that at all, as well as we're seeing people having issues of shortness of breath. Um, sometimes some patients are completely asymptomatic to any of this. Uh, we've also had to limit our use of what's called non-invasive ventilation, which is what you've probably heard a lot of, what's called BiPAP, CPAP. Um, so a lot of times we could save patients from being intubated and being placed on a ventilator by using a form of non-invasive ventilation. Um, we use this a lot with our COPD uh, population, because uh, the likelihood for them of being weaned off of the ventilator is increased. Um, so we are actually skipping non-invasive and going straight to um, them being intubated and being placed on a ventilator to limit the exposure um, to the healthcare providers. Um, some other things that we're seeing is extreme stiffening of the lungs. Um, most ventilators they work with pressure and volume. Your pressure is your driving factor to deliver your volume. 
So as you could imagine, if you take a balloon and you were to inflate that balloon, um, it's very easy, but if we added a constriction around that balloon, it makes it very, very hard to inflate it. So those are initially how your lungs work in that same sense. Um, we're also seeing an increase in what we call PEEP, which is positive in expiratory pressure. Uh, this is basically a pressure that helps to keep um, the areas of your lungs open that deal with oxygenation. Um, and we're also seeing increase of um, usage of the amount of oxygen being needed in a ventilator. Uh, you've probably also seen multiple photos through the internet and social media of patients that are being placed face um, in the beds. This is a study that indicates that we can see increase in oxygenation. It has a lot to do with the uh, atmospheric pressure and the pressure within the uh, thoracic cavity to help increase oxygenation. Um, and I know another big thing that I've heard a lot in the news and social media is um, ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this is basically just a fancy word for stiffening of the lungs and lack of being able to ventilate them to get enough oxygen to your blood to circulate throughout your body. Um, this has been something that's been around for a long time. We see this a lot in complications of like COPD and emphysema, but we're also seeing an increase in this amount with these patients with COVID-19. Um, I have a lot of connections throughout the state of Ohio. I had worked previously for Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, um, and I've been told that they are actually now seeing an increase in the amount of this new term called COVID-19 pneumonia, which is basically what's happening is from all of the edema that builds up, they build in infil infiltrates into the lungs, um, and that's a fancy word for pneumonia. So we're seeing um, the increase of infiltrates in the lungs. Um, we're seeing stiffening of the lungs as well. So it's kind of a been a little bit of an issue dealing with trying to get the right modality in keeping these patients alive. Um, and, you know, some of the scary things that we're seeing is coming into the ER, um, patients that are unresponsive. We can't really screen them to say, have you traveled outside the US? Have you been symptomatic and things like that? And we later find out that we didn't have you have the possibility of getting exposed to these patients. Um, so it's a very scary uh, thing to face working in healthcare right now. And we have to changes and trends and policies. It's daily emails and constant trying to keep up with everything. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate kind of even more of the technical explanation of what you're what you're seeing and, and what you do. Um, and with the what you're starting to see just across the profession as well. So yeah, I appreciate that perspective and um and for you being with us. It was really right. great. Um perfect. So uh, we did get one quick question for Stephanie um from Eric in the chat box. So Stephanie, um are you doing any antibody testing and do you see any benefit at this point? Uh, we are not currently doing antibody testing at um, at our hospital. Um, I don't know of any hospitals in the area that are, but we are not currently. But I do. It is something that will be coming, and I think it will be extremely valuable. And I, I there are a lot of um, antibody testing panels that we do currently do for other viruses um, that there are vaccines for. What I what I see happening in the coming years is COVID being added to that panel. So as long you know, along with um, a lot of other um, the kids are vaccinated for, I think there probably is going to be a widespread vaccine, and then um, I, I think there is going to be widespread antibody testing to be sure that everyone has the antibodies they need to be protective of this virus. But not yet. The testing that we're doing right now that I mentioned earlier is um, test. To determine if somebody has acute disease. So if you, and it's of limited value because you could do a test on Monday, that patient is then, and they're negative, then that patient is exposed to the virus and could be positive a week later. So it, it is of limited benefit. It tells us that somebody has it currently, but antibody testing will be better because it will tell us that they have had it and that they're protected. Did I answer the question? 
Yeah, and if I can add to one thing that I'd like to add to Stephanie is, is even like the assays that they're doing now, there's so many different antibody tests out there and some of them are screening tests, whereas some of them are going to be more diagnostic. So when her lab looks at it, they'll look at how, because some of them actually pair with the molecular test. So it depends on what antibody tests they are. So they're going to be looking at validating and, and what those assays provide, because there's a lot of them they've released and some of them haven't even been looked at by the FDA. So that's another big step. Um, so we did have a couple of questions submitted ahead of the um, session today. So um, these are mostly for Tina, so we can get her back on. So the first one um, is how can alumni and partners support the college during this whole situation? Well, thanks whoever asked that question. Um, so obviously, you know, we appreciate your support and we're so proud of all the work that you're out there doing. So thank you for that. Um, as far as your support of where we are today, certainly I know we've had some emeritus faculty who have asked about how they might be able to help. And I've talked to our department chairs and if you are one of those people, um, they would welcome your giving them a phone call and you could have some pointed discussion about how you might be able to uh, contribute on the program level. Uh, for other alumni, you know, obviously the clinical placements, we are very understanding of the fluidity of the situation and we obviously are not going to send our students out to places that are not ready to take them. But for those of you who do clinical preceptors, and many of you do serve as clinical preceptors for us, um, we appreciate your taking our students when you're ready. Um, we're working real closely with all, all of you uh, to make sure that if our students need the personal protection equipment, we are sending them with it. Uh, we are making sure they are well trained. And if they were to be exposed, um, to a patient who's under investigation for COVID, the college will cover the cost of that test for that student because certainly we want our students' safety and health and those of the people around them to remain uh, in good standing. So we have all of those processes that we've put in place. Uh, we also, if you are inclined uh, to help students of course, we have scholarship funds, both endowed scholarship funds that you could make a contribution to. We have current use funds that we can do. We had a, a student in one of our programs that because of the COVID interruption, um, he had an outstanding spring semester tuition bill, which made him then unable to get his diploma. Um, he wasn't off by lots of money, but any money owed to the university would withhold a diploma until that debt could be settled. And we were able to mobilize some current use monies that we had in escrow in the dean's office to cover that student's tuition gap so that he could then um, graduate and, and sit for his board exams and move out into the world of, of work in the healthcare arena. So there's always those opportunities, I think, for um, for, for helping our students if, if you're in a position to do so. And our development person, I don't know if she's on the call, but Angie Hawk or, or Bree, um, Bree Coggins would be happy to, to take any call or for that matter, I would as well if, if you have an interest in doing any of those sorts of things. Does that answer it, Bree? Yeah, that's great. You. Um, uh, somebody submitted a question about the School of Social Work, so I didn't know if you'd be able to offer any um, highlights or high level updates from the school. So the School of Social Work is right there in with it with the rest of us in terms of that. Um, we had a, they had a number of adjuncts that were teaching in the spring semester um, who are clinicians. I mean, many of our adjuncts are clinicians and trained in their discipline and they were teaching a, a semester course for us this past spring. They needed like really emergency training, if you would, to be able to get them in a remote teaching environment. And Soleil and her group in our uh, Center for Educational Technology and Instructional Support did WebEx training for them. I think they trained 10 to 12 of those folks, obviously along with some of our core faculty to help them get their courses converted. Um, we've got 
social work students back out in clinic. As I mentioned, that was one of the groups that had some students to send. So Lisa Zimmer and Jan Melcher and Wayne Kinney. Uh, I think some of you might know that uh, we have a BS completer degree in social work that's now all online. So we have students that are out in agencies that, um, you know, are employed there who are finishing their bachelor's degree in social work. Many of them are working in health and human service agencies. Some of them are social work tech type people. And those are the students we were able to get back out in clinics starting yesterday. Um, I talked to a young man on Friday afternoon. Somehow my phone number was the number they gave if they couldn't make the connection to get their PPE. So I talked to students all, all um, Friday afternoon and I talked to a young man who lived in the Dayton area. I was a single dad with two little kids under the age of five. And he had come to the university to pick up his PPE but he'd never been to our building before because he was one of the online baccalaureate completer students. So he called to say, am I in the right place? And I said, well, you know, I'm in Evendale, but tell me where you are. And he described it to me. And I said, yep, you're there. You can you know, park there, go in and get your PPE and get back to clinic on Monday. So the social work students are right there in with the whole rest of the college. They're a very integral part of our college. and. We're working with them. I was actually just talking to Ruth Ann Van Loon before I took this um, town hall. So uh, we're, we're constantly in communication with all of our program directors, the department chairs, and um, even students when, when they call me directly. So that's what's going on in social work. Great, thank you. Um... The, the other questions, you sort of hit on them a little bit. Um, I'll go ahead and throw them out there just in case you have anything to add. So um, somebody had asked about PhD students whose dissertation projects have been affected by closure of research and how you're working with them to get on track. Again, our faculty have been amazing. Uh, we only have one PhD program in the college and that's in communication sciences and disorders. And so for some of our faculty, uh, they have been able to change the aim, which meant they had to go through the IRB. Um, but again, the IRB has been also working. Everybody's working together on this. It's kind of been, I think, the silver lining of, of, uh, of this whole COVID thing. We don't have as much red tape and bureaucracy and, and delay, it seems. We're able to get things done a little bit quicker. And so they were able to change sometimes as one of our faculty uh, was able to get her student's project changed slightly and get approval through the IRB so that she could do the work um, in a telehealth situation. We, um, as you probably have been following in the media, some of the uh, restrictions around what we could use telehealth for has been relaxed. Um, to the point of social work, they're able to do some of those client visits and client counseling sessions via telehealth, and HIPAA was always a big barrier to that. And, uh, we've had some relaxation of some of those standards to make sure that those clients got those services because that is so important, in the, especially in this time. And so with the PhD students, some of the aims of their projects got slightly revised. IRB has allowed us to make those changes and the students have been able to continue on. In other cases, it has been disrupted, but we kept those students on scholarship. They still got their stipend. In many cases, they were doing data analysis at a distance. Uh, if they couldn't do data analysis at a distance because they didn't have the computer access that they needed, needed to actually be in the building to get that or whatever, um, they've been doing lit reviews. They've been working on manuscripts. So they're progressing them in their program. Suzanne Boyce, who is the director of our PhD program in CSD, has come up with some real innovative things for them, some of them to do over the summer. And one of the innovative things she's got them doing is working with CETUS to learn how to teach remotely so they can offer some online course modules in the fall. So we're really, um, I can't take credit for any of this, but I think our faculty have been incredibly student-centered around how to keep our students moving forward in their, in their program and not have it just be a shutdown interruption. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Um, you had touched on enrollment numbers for the fall. Um, 
somebody was asking about a decision about enrollment for the college for the fall. I'm assuming that meant it just the state of fall and attending classes, but I, I guess another part of it could be when when numbers are finalized for the fall. And um, I mean, I you said orientation start June 8th. Yeah, so really, um, we've, the university has extended confirmation to allow, what we're seeing, I think, with COVID is some of this um, interest in students wanting to stay closer to home. So for people who maybe were away at school and then got returned back home prematurely in the spring semester, they're a little hesitant to go back away again, and they, they want to be able to keep going in their program but stay closer to home. And so in some cases, you see Cincinnati is their area of home, so they are looking to take classes with us in the fall. So there's a bit of that going on. As far as the college, as I mentioned, our strategy really has been to put what we can online, but we've been working with each program director to say, what do you need to do in the lab? Um, and if typically it's in the lab, and then uh, figuring out what number of courses those would be and how we would manage the social distancing and be able to safely deliver those courses in a face-to-face. -face. So we're thinking more of a hybrid uh, delivery model. The university's got multiple teams working on this and they will make the final call. I was just on a dean's meeting from three to four today and they're hoping to have a decision made because you can imagine what we do is just a fraction of what the college and the university has to do across the campus. And so they have to see what that number looks like and how we can keep a low density of people and make a decision in that regard. And they're thinking they'll be able to do that by the beginning of June. But our mode of delivery will be hybrid or blended, like I just described. This is as a university or potentially could be all remote again for fall, and that decision will be made on high, but the college will be prepared in either case because we've been working on uh, a different model since the end of April for, for fall. So hopefully that helps. I, I think everybody wishes we knew, but we, we don't have the final word, and then we'll have to be good soldiers and do whatever the university decides, but I think we'll be ready either way. Great. Yeah, it's, I feel like every day is different and we, we learn more hourly. Um, before we wrap here, up here, uh, those are all the pre-submitted questions. We do have one more note from Brian Earle. Um, there's a PhD dissertation defense for Chelsea Blankenship, who is an audiology student tomorrow. Um, so if anyone's interested in that information, um, feel free to reach out and we can forward that information if you um, you'd like to see that. So um, perfect. If there are any, I'm kind of checking the chat. Um, I do want to be mindful of time at 704. So uh, we really appreciate everyone's participation and engagement with us. Um, if you are still on the phone only audio, um, if you could send me a note to let me know you were here because I can't see your name listed, that would be great. So we can we can track your attendance. Um, but we appreciate it. We look forward to hearing from you and um, we will we'll send out the, the recording for this in the next few days and a follow-up email just with more contact information and we say you can get involved. So um, again, thank you so much and stay well and go Bearcats. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.